Lately, I have been on quite the hot streak. And I'm not going to lie, guys. After clearing a good number of epic, lengthy, triple A video games from my backlog, I needed a break. I felt like switching things up and jumping into some shorter, simpler games. As luck would have it, this realisation coincided with the release of Animal Well. Now, I am a massive fan of Donkey, so this had been a long time coming for me, but actually getting my hands on it was something else entirely. I'll save my deeper thoughts on this wonderful game for later in the video, but suffice to say it lit a fire under me. We are going to cover quite a decent variety of games today, ranging from short and simple, to short and really quite brutal, as well as technically short, but also with enough content to keep you coming back for, well, forever really. So join me today as we look at 10 short games that can be beaten in a weekend. The first game we're going to talk about today is the single greatest cat simulator I have ever seen. Obviously, I adored playing Stray, but that game was largely on rails. Here you have a full-on mini open-world cat adventure, very clearly made by people who know their source material. Not only are all of your furry protagonist movements and idol animations absolutely perfect representations of how real cats behave, you also have not one, but two buttons dedicated to knocking objects from high places, as well as stealth mechanics for sneaking up on unsuspecting birds, and various preset animations for your cat to perform, including the all-important Big Stretch. Little Kitty was so clearly made by seasoned cat owners, they have perfectly nailed every aspect of these equally majestic and ridiculous creatures. Your adventure follows a very simple premise of you stretched too hard after a nap and fell off your ledge, and now you need to find your way back. Along the way, you'll meet plenty of other animals, and your interactions with them are as bonkers as they are brilliant, ranging from a dog who has like 30 tennis balls already, but he really needs you to find his three favorite ones because they're slightly different and therefore better, to a tanuki, who has created a fast travel pet work. Yes, I said pet work. You can clear this game in an afternoon, but there's still plenty of side stuff if you want more from your time in the big city. Whether it's stealing fresh fish to power up your paws, leaving your toe bean autograph in wet cement, or tripping up all those pesky humans, there's plenty here to sink your claws into. If I haven't already sold you on this one, please enjoy these photos of my actual cat, being incredibly displeased about the presence of such a convincing digital cat in the house. Even if this game had sucked, it would have been worth it just for this. I love this game so much that I finished half of it in one sitting. Positively brimming with 80s synth music and charm, Stranger Things 3 is a classic arcade-style beat-em-up. It harkens back to a simpler time, when you could punch everyday objects and be rewarded with coins. But on the flip side, you also ran the risk of having to fight Russian Terminator clones if you ventured into wooded areas. Thankfully, this modern spin on the genre comes with far more freedom than we had back in those halcyon days of coin-operated arcade games. And it's up to you to choose the order you tackle missions and side quests in, and you can power up your characters through a nice perk and crafting system too. As a child of the 80s, I cannot overstate how much I appreciated the modern quality of life improvements, like being able to hot swap between and control any character regardless of the mission. Because no matter how beefy Hopper might be, nobody tops Eleven and her crowd controlling psychic powers. The game follows the third series pretty closely, so if you're a fan like me, you will really struggle to put this one down. And if you haven't seen the show, then please watch it after my video, because it's brilliant. Chorus is an interesting one, and not just because the font they use make it look like it's called Chorves. Chorus is a space fighter game, which technically makes this the third one I have played since the days of the original PlayStation, with the other two being that level in Halo Reach and a few levels in Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. I don't like space fighter games because I struggle to remember all my dimensions and find myself endlessly chasing targets that have just fallen past me, only to find I have a super tiny window to attack them again before they fly past me once more. Chorus absolutely can suffer from these same issues, but it also very quickly introduces you to your rights, 
which are special abilities unique to your pilot that conveniently enough allow you to very simply counter these problems. The first one allows you to drift, essentially giving you the option to strafe your ship and very quickly reacquire your target. And then you get the power to teleport directly behind the target, which is exactly as delightful as it sounds. You still have to consider different enemy types and their different defense layers, and how you need to switch between your weapon types to deal with them. So it's not like the rights make you an overpowered god, but more like they make it far less tedious for you to actually enjoy the game. The writing, however, is more than a bit cheesy, and your whispering inner thoughts get old really fast. But on the whole, Chorus is a fast-paced, fun space romp in some truly beautiful environments, and it really does deserve a lot more credit than it currently gets. Sonic Mania is completely insane and absolutely brilliant. It is exactly what we remember Sonic being like, and exactly what we need him to be. But at the same time, almost completely fresh, and it endlessly toys with our expectations. Like when you get to the second part of the chemical plant, and the liquid can now become various states of jelly. Or how when you start the game, it seems like it's going to be Sonic 3, but then you get whatever the hell this is, followed by Sonic 1, except it's different, and now you're in the special stage from Sonic 3, but then you're chasing a UFO. And this is all within the first 10 minutes. I don't know, I can't keep up, but I love it. The bosses are all new and brilliantly designed, with some of them really keeping you on your toes. Some of them are so crazy, the helicopter chase being the first one that springs to mind, that if someone asked me how I managed to do it, I would have to respond... I don't know! I generally have no clue how I finish the levels. I just keep moving forward, and through all the insanity I somehow manage to make it to the boss, and that is exceptional level design for you. I will say though that it's extra special when you get to see something completely new, like the Studiopolis? Studiopolis? I don't know, the third zone. A casino zone might not be an original idea for Sonic, but as far as I know this one hasn't been in any previous games, and even if it has, it was still my first time here. The design is somewhere between if it ain't broke, but also let's give him lots of crazy new shit to do, and I loved every second of it. Returning to Callisto! Requesting emergency clearance! Negative, UJC Caron. You are not authorized for re-entry. Sorry, but I got no choice! First up, I have to say, this game is absolutely gorgeous. Seriously, the production values are through the roof. In a truly horrific and frequently disgusting adventure, time and again I couldn't help but stop and notice the level of attention to detail. Like how different weapon upgrades have different animations when you print them, or how in this delightful romp through waste management, notice how the body drops in the path of these blender things and they actually slow down as they blend the body? You gotta love that level of detail. Thankfully, it's not just pretty to look at. The Callisto Protocol is a well-acted and tightly paced adventure with a gripping story that never failed to hold my attention. At this point, you might be wondering, wasn't this game kind of a big flop? Well, yes, yes it was, and for a few reasons I think. First of all, the Dead Space comparisons are unavoidable, but there is also no comparison. The Dead Space remake is a full-on 10 out of 10 masterpiece, whose only shortcoming was its price. The Callisto Protocol might be a truly stunning good time, but it's not without its issues. For one thing, there's no map, or waypoint, or just generally any way to keep track of where you are, or where you're going, or what you're doing. And it's these kinds of basic oversights that really took me by surprise, considering how much love and care have been paid elsewhere. Also, the controls are just not intuitive or refined enough for what the game expects from you, especially considering the focus on melee combat. And say it with me, kids, nobody, like, actually nobody, likes quick time events. Just stop. You can counter most of these control issues in the accessibility options, which I did, and whilst it certainly does make the game a hell of a lot less frustrating, it also makes it significantly easier, so it does upset the challenge balance a bit. In short, if you can make peace with simplified controls and some pretty embarrassing shortcomings and just enjoy the ride, then you will probably have a great time here. Yeah. 
Animal Well is the purest example of what a video game can and should be. It's challenging, but not too punishing. It requires you to think, but it's never obtuse about it. Everything is logic based and so gosh darn elegant in its execution. In true Metroidvania style, as well as just good old fashioned classic game design, you'll see ledges too high up for you to jump to, or switches that you can't quite reach yet, and that tantalising taste of possibility just keeps on pulling you further in. The satisfaction I felt when I realised I could stay on the bubbles without popping them, using them as a downward sort of lift, was possibly the purest video game moment I have had in years. Now add to that a hefty dose of adrenaline, when I realised the sea monster was actually releasing his bubbles in a pattern that would allow me to climb them, or the full on light bulb moment when I figured out the infinite loop fountain. Animal Well is simply jammed full of moments like this. It's genuinely that good, and I cannot wait to see what Big Mode do next. If you only play one game from this list, make it Animal Well. It's like Halo 2 and Halo 3 combined. Streets of Rage 4 is quite simply the pinnacle of 2D beat-em-ups. The nostalgia tap is on full blast here. Right off the bat you have access to every iteration of every classic character. The controls are instantly familiar because they are almost exactly the same. Whilst every character has unique moves, they all share the same move set, so it's easy to experiment between all the different characters, and when you use Cherry's guitar slide for the first time, you'll wonder why the hell you waited so long to give the new characters a try. You can clear the main campaign in an hour or two at the most, but all of the characters and difficulty levels will keep you coming back for more, and if you have the Mr X DLC, get ready for a game that will last you a lifetime, or until they make Streets of Rage 5 I guess. As well as adding some new characters to your roster, the DLC lets you play in challenge arenas, where each level gets progressively harder, but you also get RNG bonuses, like adding fire to your attacks or increasing your movement speed. Believe me when I tell you these levels will become absolutely insane. Your performance in the DLC translates into points to spend on your characters, and they all have alternative movesets you can unlock for use in both the DLC and the campaign, so there's plenty to keep coming back for. Also, Blaze was my first crush as a child, and the fact that you can now make her look like Alana Pierce has me wondering if the developers have been stalking my Instagram. If there is one thing that I have learned from the Classics Collection on PS Plus, it's that most of the time, you really should leave these games in your memories. Thankfully, there are exceptions to this rule, and this wonderful, wonderful Tomb Raiding collection is by far the best of the best I've seen so far. Now that you can save as often as you like at any point in any level, you no longer have to worry about gruelling runbacks when you die. And I say when you die, because you will die. A lot. the tiniest mistake can and often will insta-kill you. These games are now thankfully a lot less punishing when you're trying to figure out how to progress, and as a result you can actually get through them in a reasonably short chunk of time. Astonishing difficulty levels aside, this collection is just perfect. The remastering has very clearly been done with tons of love, and the updated controls add a much needed sense of fluidity to the experience. Time and again I've been hit right in the nostalgic feels by this collection. Classic Lara is iconic for a reason, and it's amazing to see the kind of ideas that were brought to life at the start of the 3D gaming era. And I know I'm not the only one hoping to see the return of a more confident and seasoned Tomb Raider whenever the next instalment arrives, and not just for reasons involving walking freezers and aging butlers. <laughs> Uh, I have very mixed feelings about Bug Snacks. On the one hand, it's great, it really is. It's super charming, it's well made, the writing is just the right side of puntastic, 
and it's a colourful and creative premise. I loved meeting with the editor at the start and hearing all about the different Grump legends. Elizabeth Megafig is either a con artist or a lunatic! And I enjoyed meeting the different character archetypes, like the farmer who talks like a cowboy and the very obvious influencer type. O.M.G. All the different creatures are cool too and it was fun figuring out the different trap combinations needed to rein them in. And I can see how this game has such a loyal following. Here's the but though. I don't like Pokemon. <laughs> and a catch em all gameplay loop is not enough to hold my attention. Also, animals that just repeat their own name. Even as I'm typing this, I can hear that goddamn bunger in my head. I can't be the only person that finds this really annoying, right? I'd heard a lot of good things and I really tried to persevere, but after a couple of hours... Done! Also, and I'm sure I can't be the only one here, I found something really sinister about eating the bug snacks. Something just really did not sit right with me about it. I'm guessing this might feature into the story at some point, but I just didn't have the patience to find out. To be fair, if you are into this sort of game, and or you just really like Pokemon, I have zero doubt that you will enjoy bug snacks. So it's an easy recommend. Of all the games I have played in my life, there are very few that I have completed in one sitting. Astro's Playroom is quite simply one of the happiest afternoons I have ever spent with a controller in my hands. I have owned my PS5 for just shy of three years now, and I am ashamed that it has taken me this long to get around to this delightful freebie. Astro's Playroom oozes charm, confidence and fun, literally every second that it is on your screen. The little easter eggs for all the games over the years were just so brilliant, and between rollerball, a monkey suit and a rocket, there were so many awesome ways to remind me of all the things the PS5 controller can do, even if nobody really bothers to do anything with them. Your journey through the inner workings of a PS5 packs in tons of creativity, your little Astrobot handles like a dream, and while you will get some minor challenges, this is largely a very non-threatening game. The SSD-themed superhighway and GPU jungle were true standouts, but I'm an IT technician by day, so my top spot has to go to how there was a whole Arctic-themed cooling section too, because in my mind it raises awareness of proper airflow, and gives me hope that one day I won't have to awkwardly ask people how often they work from their bed when they bring me a laptop that has overheated. But I digress, Astro's Playroom is an absolute banger. It's chock full of funky different mechanics and every one of them is intuitive. As a rule, I don't really care for collectibles in video games, but the artifacts here smash me right in the nostalgia feels over and over again. I mean, just check this out. And there we have it my friends, those were 10 short games I recently cleared from my backlog, presented here for your consideration. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts about any of these games down in the comments, especially if you can fill me in on whether or not the whole bug snacks thing really is as sinister as it seems. If you'd like to support my channel, please do consider liking and subscribing. And don't forget, you can follow along with my backlog progress using the link in the description. Thank you very much for watching guys, see you on the next one.